Okay, so uh, hey everybody, um, my name is Cody Melton. I'm a postdoc at Sandia National Laboratories. Um, really excited to be giving this talk. Uh, I think this is probably the first tutorial on spin orbit for QMC that's ever been given. So um, uh, you guys are either lucky or uh, not lucky, depending on how this goes. But um, excited to give you this talk. Um, so let's get started. Um, wait, it's not changing. What's going on? There we go. Okay, so as you know, the title of the talk is Spin Orbit Coupling in Quantum Monte Carlo. And for those who know, spin orbit is ultimately a relativistic effect. And so what we, if we're interested in actually studying materials to high accuracy, um, one would think that you would need to actually use the full Dirac equation to be able to incorporate all of the relativistic effects uh, to study heavy element materials where relativity becomes important. Um, so we're going to start from the Dirac equation and then kind of work our way down to what we actually do in QMC. Um, so the Dirac equation kind of looks something like this, where we have this modified kinetic energy. Um, and then you have your normal kind of Coulomb interactions between the electrons and the ions and the electron-electron interaction. And if you're using this relativistic Hamiltonian, um, for those who, fami who are familiar, this alpha and this beta are actually four by four matrices uh, for operators, and that implies that the the, the mini body state, the, the wave function that you get, ends up being a four component vector or a four spinner, as we call it, a four component spinner. Um, setting aside all the complications to actually solving this for a second, assuming we can solve for the wave functions for this Dirac equation, we would have included all of the uh, relativistic effects in our material um, with minimal approximations. And this can have a um, significant impact on the material properties. One of the, I guess, quintessential examples of this is actually um, the gold is the color of gold. It's this is actually purely due to a relativistic effect, um, and so this kind of demonstrates that relativity is quite important, especially for heavier materials. So um, if you go through and you calculate, uh, in this case, uh, the imaginary part of the dielectric constant, or a related quantity, the re reflectivity, uh, you can do it either fully non-relativistic, which is kind of what we've been talking about throughout this entire uh, QMC workshop, is non-relativistic calculations. And you'll see that um, compared to the fully relativistic or scalar relativistic solutions, there's a pretty significant shift between where this peak begins, uh, from about 3.5 EV down to about 2.1 EV. The 2.1 EV corresponds roughly to um, the color of yellow, which is ultimately why we see gold as the color that we do and why it's not silver or something. Um, so ultimately relativity is uh, extremely important for measurable quantities that we're gonna see in materials. Uh, and perhaps maybe more um, interesting are some of the recent um, studies in topological materials um, where spin orbit can play an important role. Um, for example, in splitting surface states uh, to help um, generate these topologically protected surface states. Um, I'm not going to obviously go into a lot of detail about this, but uh, just suffice it to say that spin orbit can play it in relativistic effects can play an important role in describing or in generating interesting kind of material properties. Um, I listed a review down here that has a bunch of other uh, really interesting examples where relativity makes a huge difference. Um, so we know that we can include relativity by solving the Dirac equation. Well, could we actually use our QMC methods for this? So to kind of talk through this first, I want to focus in a little bit about the um, single particle states, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian uh, in different levels of approximations to the Dirac equation, just to kind of uh, get our feet under, under us. So first off, if we look at a kind of non-relativistic <clears throat> uh, Hamiltonian, this is kind of what we're used to dealing with. Uh, these are the single particle states of lead or something, uh, some heavy element. Um, and they have the normal levels that we're used to, 1s, 2s, 2p, et cetera. And then eventually you run into a, uh, a continuum at, in high, uh, you know, high energy uh, continuum for scattering states. The full Dirac equation solution looks a little bit different. Um, and if you're following along on the slides, uh, you should be able to zoom in and see that um, there's a few different features that kind of pop out. One is that if you're doing a full Dirac equation, you end up having a very, very low energy continuum um, that pops up if you're solving the kind of a full Dirac Coulomb Hamiltonian. Uh, but additionally, there's kind of 
extra things that pop out. One is that the energy level shift. So if you look at, if you focus in on the 1S level, it shifts. If you look at the 6S level, it also shifts down. Uh, but then kind of the key is that for other levels like the 6P and the 5D, they actually get split. And this splitting is actually due to the spin orbit, which will, is ultimately what we're interested in. Um, there's also scalar relativistic solutions. So this is kind of an average relativity. And what we're doing in, in these kind of approximations is that you end up neglecting the kind of deep low lying spectra, but then you also are now matching the fully relativistic Dirac spectrum uh, for the fermionic states. This, um, this deep spectrum is the positronic solutions, whereas these are kind of the fermionic or electronic solutions. Um, and you end up matching up now uh, in the average relativistic sense, you match up all of the levels, but the main difference is that for the split states, you're only, you're only matching the average of the split states. Um, so this 6P is a different energy level than this 6P, and it's because it's the average of the splitting. And this is what we call scalar relativity or average relativity. And then back in week, I think six, we introduced pseudopotentials or effective core potentials and typically what we do in effective core potentials is to match directly to a scalar relativistic all electron Hamiltonian. So the energy levels end up matching up to this Hamiltonian and not the fully non-relativistic. They match the scalar, but they're not actually able to generate these splittings, which is the spin orbit interaction that we're interested in. Okay, so can we use our QMC for these methods? Well, first off, diffusion Monte Carlo um, is a projector method. So what that means is that it projects out the lowest energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. I'm showing here just the single particle states, but if you consider the actual many body states of the Hamiltonian for a Dirac equation, there's still a low lying positronic spectrum that's very, very deep in energy. And so a diffusion Monte Carlo method that projects out the lowest energy states is gonna have to come up with some approximation or some stabilization method to prevent you from collapsing into getting a deep low lying state whenever you're interested in the electronic solutions. Uh, this could be done. Um, we should be able to generate some diffusion Monte Carlo method that could do that. But assuming you could, you would still run into the same kind of issues that we did in normal all electron calculations in QMC. Uh, this is because um, the core electrons dominate the energy and therefore they dominate the fluctuations. Uh, even in a relativistic sense, the energies go roughly as z squared. So the fluctuations go roughly as z, four, z to the fourth. And so these deep core states that dominate the energy are dominating the fluctuations and make it very, very hard to resolve um, chemical accuracy that we're interested in for studying you know, the chemistry of systems, for example. <clears throat> Additionally, these deep core electrons, another kind of complication would pop up that the deep core electrons uh, if we're doing quantum Monte Carlo, where we are sampling in real space, so namely each electron has a position and we keep track of its position as it moves, um, the core electrons are actually moving relativistically near the speed of light. Uh, for example, the radial velocity of a 1s electron um, goes roughly as z over 137 times c for its speed. So for something like lead that has an, uh, a z of 82, the 1s electron is moving about 60% the speed of light whereas its valence electrons are moving much, much slower. And so you can imagine that in a diffusion Monte Carlo sense where we're sampling in real space, dealing with the core electrons that are moving around so fast versus the valence electrons, which are moving around much slower can be a complication. So all of these things kind of lead to suggesting that maybe we want to not deal with the full Dirac equation and not deal with this. And in, in fact, maybe we could kind of leverage this pseudopotential idea where the normal pseudopotentials, as I showed uh, kind of when I was focusing in here, they match up to an averaged relativistic Hamiltonian. But maybe we can modify a pseudopotential in an appropriate way that would generate the splitting that you see in the fully relativistic Hamiltonian. And if that's the case, then we can incorporate spin orbit coupling with pseudopotentials and have kind of similar cost in our QMC calculations. So this is ultimately what we're after. Um, uh, so the core electrons provide an effective potential for the valence electrons. So ultimately, we, like I just said, we want to use effective core potentials to remove those core electrons that don't participate in the chemistry. But in doing so, do we still need to work with a full 
four component Dirac equation. Um, because as I showed in the first slide, the, the eigenstates of the Dirac equation are four component spinners. So do we need to work with this? Well, not really. Um, so I'm showing on the left, the um, single particle orbitals of, I think the lead atom again. Um, and I'm plotting the four components of the spinners. So it turns out that you can label for valence electrons, you can label the spinners uh, as large components, which are just two components of the spinner, and then small components, which are another two components of the spinner. And it turns out that the large components are these solid lines, and then the dashed lines are the small components of the spinner. You'll notice that in the valence region, so this is where kind of chemistry happens, uh, the small components of the spinner are effectively negligible. They're basically zero everywhere. And the large components of the spinner look just like our normal kind of single particle orbitals that we're used to. The only difference is, net, is that now they're split into two different states. So you end up having, for like a P state, you end up having a 6P one half and a 6P three halves, where the one half and three half correspond to J quantum numbers. Um, but the small components are completely negligible. And so this implies that if we're going to use pseudopotentials, which are going to kind of remove all of these uh, core, these nodes kind of near the nucleus, and just smooth out these orbitals, we can generate a pseudopotential that's going to, one, reproduce this splitting, but then we also only have to deal with a two-component spinner. We don't need to worry about these small components since they're zero anyway. So this is kind of pointing at exactly what we need in QMC. We need a pseudopotential that can generate this splitting somehow, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, and then we're going to work with two-component spinners because the small components don't matter, and so therefore we don't need a full Dirac equation. Okay, but can we use our normal pseudopotentials? So in, uh, as was introduced in week six, I believe, um, the pseudopotentials look like the following. So you have a sum over angular momentum, and then each angular momentum has a different potential that it feels, this W sub L, and then you end up writing it as projectors over spherical harmonics. If we're interested in reproducing this splitting, so the 6P1, this 6P state gets split into a 6P1 half and a 6P3 halves, it, it can't feel the same potential for each, like each P state can't feel the same potential because you end up having a potential that needs to act on a P1 half and a P3 halves uh, if we want to generate this splitting. So ultimately, what ends up happening is that if we can write down a pseudopotential that looks something like this, where we have a potential that acts on each angular momentum channel, but then also acts on each individual J channel uh, separately, then we can actually hope to kind of generate a spin orbit pseudopotential that's going to reproduce the full Dirac spectrum. And this is what we're after. Um, so ultimately, if you're looking at ECPs that remove these core electrons, the goal, if you're trying to construct a kind of pseudopotential, uh, is to actually try and match the full Dirac spectrum where you're going to generate these splittings. And the form of your pseudopotential should look something like this. It needs to be projectors over um, what we call spin spherical harmonics, these LJ, MJ states. Okay, so there's one additional thing to consider before actually talking about how this is really done in QMC, in that it's that not only do we need pseudopotentials that are now projectors over J states, we also need um, two component spinners, but we also have to recognize another change that's gonna happen in our sampling in QMC. So in standard quantum Monte Carlo, since there's no spin interactions, the spin commutes with the Hamiltonian. And so what we do is that when we're writing down our electrons, our Walker configurations, each electron gets a position in space, but then we also label it with a spin, either up or down. But since spin is conserved, as we do our, say, diffusion Monte Carlo moves, where we drift and diffuse and then reweight the walkers and accept or reject the moves, uh, when a walker drifts and diffuses, if it was an up electron, it stays an up electron throughout the move. So the spin is conserved through the particle moves um, in the case that spin commutes with Hamiltonian. But now we're going to have a spin orbit interaction. We're going to have um, spin in the Hamiltonian, so spin doesn't commute anymore. And so the spin really needs to become a dynamic variable, just like the particle coordinates. Um, so as we drift and diffuse, we're going to need to also allow for the spin to change during the particle moves. And so these are all things that we need to consider when we're talking about trying to incorporate this into a quantum Monte Carlo method. 
So in QMC pack, this is kind of laying it, reiterating what I've talked about, and then going to go into kind of point by point detail about exactly what we do in QMC pack. So we need single particle spinners that are going to be two component. And we're going to get them from some DFT code, just like we have done in the past for single particle orbitals uh, in the non spin orbit case. Uh, then once we have the two component spinners that we're interested in, we're going to plug these into a many body wave function and construct a Slater Jastro type wave function from these spinners. And then when we carry out our VMC and DMC algorithms, it needs to make sure that it is um, respecting and incorporating the sampling of the spin degree of freedom. And then the last part is the pseudo potential that I've harped on so far. Uh, we need to include, include this new uh, spin orbit pseudo potential operator. Uh, just for reference, uh, all of this is uh, the spin orbit kind of implementation was all developed back in 2016 uh, during my PhD. Uh, we have a number of papers talking about this, but I think this is the one that is the most detailed. So if you're interested in kind of some of the more nitty gritty details, I would recommend kind of looking at that paper. Okay. So what are we doing in QMC pack? Well, and in QMC in general, we first focus on the single particle spinners again. So in general, you can write down a spinner in the following form. It's a two component, so it has an up component, which I'm writing as this chi up times this phi up, which is the spatial orbital, plus a phi down times a chi down. Um, and if we're writing down the, uh, this, the electronic state, the, the it's state in configuration space, I'm labeling it now with an X. So it has the spatial coordinates R, and now it has a, a spin degree of freedom that I talked about we need to somehow sample. So in QMC, we could, there's a number of ways that we could actually do this and sample these spin degrees of freedom. And one of the ways that we can attempt is to use what we call a minimal representation for the spinners. Namely that if we let the spin be a discrete variable, um, either plus or minus one, we can allow it to hit a spin state. And depending on if S is, um, if, it, if S is positive one, and it hits a spin up state, it'll give us a one. And if S is positive one and it hits a down state, it'll give us a zero and vice versa. And so what that'll do is that if we're sampling the spin degree of freedom along our kind of quantum Monte Carlo trajectory, if the spin changes, what we effectively do is turn on and off different components of the spinner. Um, this is kind of what happens in the minimal config or the minimal representation. This is actually somewhat problematic for QMC. And the reason is the following. You can imagine that if we have tons of single particle spinners that we're plugging into our Slater determinants, and we're proposing Walker moves or electron moves during our simulation where we are now flipping the spin, we're effectively turning on and off different components of the spinner all the time. And effectively that le can lead to large changes in the wave function and therefore large fluctuations in the local energy. And the more number, the larger the number of electrons that you have, the more efficient this, inefficient this can become. Uh, and so this is actually a problematic representation to use in QMC. And so what do we actually do in QMC? Uh, we actually take the spin variable and make it a continuous variable. So we let spin or the spin variable run from zero to two pi now. Um, and if you plug it into the spin state, like the spin up, we now are using a representation for the spin as e to the is. So this is now a complex function instead of the discrete kind of Kronecker deltas that I was showing in the discrete representation. And then for spin down, we have e to the minus is. This seems like a complication, but in all, it, it actually makes life a little bit easier. Uh, by choosing this representation, we actually preserve some of the spin properties. So we know that kind of a spin state needs to be orthogonal to each other, right? Um, so like an up and a down have to be orthogonal to each other. And so by using this representation, we get a, the 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 correct behavior, namely that they're orthogonal. Um, so it preserves the properties of the spins by using this continuous representation. And in fact, these functions are periodic. So in, in reality, we don't even have to restrict the spin to be from zero to two pi. It can be any real number since they're just periodic on that, on that domain. So the spin really is now just another real number that can run from negative infinity to infinity. And all that does is if we're sampling that spin degree of freedom in quantum Monte Carlo, all that's done is extend our kind of sampling 
the dimension of our sampling space, the configuration space. Previously, we had our the the um, the collective position coordinates of the electrons lived in R three n. Well, now they're just living in R four n, where we also are now including this the spin, and it's a continuous number, and the spin variable can just be sampled in the exact same way. And since we're using Monte Carlo methods, it doesn't really care about the dimensionality of the space. So we're not really adding too much cost to ourselves. Okay. So for the single particle spinners, we actually need to get them from somewhere. So I talked about our spin representation, namely this e to the is and the e to the minus is. But where do we get our, our um, <clears throat> spatial orbitals, the spatial components of the spinners? Um, so these parts. Um, so it depends. Uh, if we're working with atoms and molecules, we have an interface to a code called Dirac. Um, Dirac is a relativistic quantum chemistry code. Um, it's quite robust. It can do um, normal non-relativistic kind of quantum chemistry that you're used to. Um, it can do two component effective four potential calculations, uh, which is what we're ultimately interested in. It can do two component all electron, and then it can actually do and solve the full four component kind of Dirac equation. And it can do this with a variety of different um, levels of theory. So it can do hartree fock or dirac fock um, various flavors of uh, configuration interaction, a couple cluster methods with you know, perturbative triples, et cetera. And then it also has DFT methods. Um, we support kind of generating wave functions from this code in a uh, executable that's provided with QMC pack called convert for QMC. And more on this later in the um, actual tutorial section the hands-on set, uh, session. But additionally, we also have interfaces for doing solid state materials. So actually incorporating spin orbit into kind of real solid materials, bulk materials. And we can do this through an interface to either quantum espresso or a, um, another code called RNG DFT, which is a uh, real space multi-grid uh, DFT code instead of a plane wave code like quantum espresso. Both of these can generate our spinners and they work in a two component effective core potential formalism as well. And so they just provide us with these phi ups and phi downs. And then internally in QMC pack, we tack on these extra complex um, spin factors. Quantum espresso can be generated from uh, a, conver a converter called a convert PW for QMC. It's also provided with QMC pack. And in the QMC pack manual, there is actually um, kind of a walkthrough of how to do this for quantum espresso. And then for RNG DFT, uh, if you've ever used that code, all you have to do is kind of tell it write QMC pack restart, and it will just generate the wave function files for us. So we don't have to do any extra converters, which is nice. Okay. So we have our single particle spinners in hand. So what do we do with them? We now need to build out a many body wave function. Uh, if you look now at the um, trial wave function, the psi t, um, we normally, in the non-spin orbit case, non-spinner case, we had a slater jastrow wave function. And it turned out that in, if spin doesn't, isn't present in our Hamiltonian and is conserved, we could write down electrons as either and label them as always spin up or label them always as spin down. And what that effectively allowed for is when you're writing down your many-body wave function, it actually decouples into a single determinant, or sorry, a product of two determinants, namely an up determinant which is an n up by n up matrix of up orbitals that you then take the determinant of, and then a matrix of n down by n down orbitals that you then take a determinant of. Whenever we move from this kind of single particle orbital picture into a spinner picture, uh, that distinction no longer applies because an electron just isn't, isn't just up or isn't just down throughout the simulation. It, you know, the spin is allowed to vary. And so we actually have to work with a um, larger determinant that's just the number of electrons by the number of electrons. But that's the, really the only change that happens whenever you're constructing the metabody wave function. Uh, and inside QMC pack, all we had to do was gen uh, generalize this to not just always require two determinants, which was actually how the code was written, but to allow for one larger determinant. And once that's done, now we have a many-body wave function for spinners. Um, one thing that I'm going to go on a quick aside here is that for these single particle spinners, you'll notice that regardless of what the um, 
regardless of whether or not these spin up spatial orbitals or spin down spatial orbitals, whether or not they're real or complex, because we're multiplying now by these complex spin functions, the spinner is always inherently complex. And therefore, when you plug it into this matrix and take a determinant, that part is complex. And so the full trial wave function is now complex. And it turns out that in Diffusion Monte Carlo, the, the approximation that we've been using the entire time, namely the fixed node approximation, doesn't actually apply to complex wave functions because the fixed node requires you it to be real. It has to be able to, the fixed node separates uh, configuration space into positive regions and negative regions. But when you have complex numbers, that distinction no longer applies. So for um, complex wave functions, we actually have to work with another approximation in order to get around the Fermi unsigned problem. Um, <clears throat> so if you write down your wave function, you can, if it's complex, you can write it down in this form where we have an amplitude rho, which is just the magnitude of the wave function. Um, times some phase factor, e to the i phi. And if you plug this into the imaginary time Schrodinger equation, uh, it decouples, if you look at the real and imaginary parts, into a time evolution for the amplitude and a time evolution for the phase. Uh, so these are coupled differential equations. The amplitude equation looks very, very similar to what we've seen for our normal kind of diffusion Monte Carlo Schrodinger equation, in that we have a kinetic energy and we have a potential energy. And the only real difference is that now there's kind of an additional potential being generated from the phase. Uh, but you're also needing to solve for the phase, which has also a kinetic energy kind of relation on the phase. And then this complicated relationship between the amplitude. So what do we do if you're dealing with <clears throat> complex uh, wave functions is to apply the fixed phase approximation, which basically implies that what we're going to do is take a trial wave function and calculate its phase and then hold our solution to have that same phase throughout the entire simulation. And that completely neglects the time evolution now of this phase equation. And the trial phase just gets plugged in now to the amplitude equation. And so now we just have a Schrodinger equation for the time evolution of our amplitude. And we can now just apply diffusion Monte Carlo to this equation and get our energies out, uh, subject to a new potential coming from this fixed phase. It turns out that fixed node is actually just a special case of a fixed phase. Um, if you were to have a real trial wave function, you can actually just reformulate your entire code, for example, to always work in a fixed phase formalism. And just in the case where you have a real valued wave function, you can set the phase to be either zero or pi, depending on if the trial wave function is positive or negative, and then actually completely regenerates the normal fixed node algorithm that, you're in, that you've uh, become familiar with. And then, of course, in the fixed phase, the phase is now some complicated function of the imaginary and real parts of the wave function. Uh, so we're always having to work in the fixed phase approximation. But also, if you've, if you work through the tutorials in the, um, I think week five, the solid examples, and you ran with twist average boundary conditions, you've actually already used this approximation. You just didn't know you were using it. Um, this is because whenever you have arbitrary twists, uh, that twist is basically adding a phase, a complex phase to your um, trial wave function, and therefore you have to use this fixed phase algorithm. Um, and this is actually handled in um, the QMCPAC underscore complex binary uh, file whenever you compile QMCPAC with complex turned on. It will be running the fixed phase approximation internally. You just don't have, it, it just does everything internally for you. Okay, so we have our um, single particle spinners, we have our trial wave function. Uh, now we want to talk about the sampling of the spins and what changes there. So in Diffusion Monte Carlo, as we know, um, we're taking an imaginary time to infinity limit of this kind of projection operator, or this time evolution operator onto the trial wave function. And as you propagate forward in imaginary time, you get the ground state wave function. And then ultimately you can take the grounds, get the ground state energy out of that. The way we realize this in QMC is to rewrite that into an integral formulation where we start with a wave function at some time in, and we sample this Green's function, this approximation to the Green's function that moves us forward one step in imaginary time to a new position at a new time in plus one. And then we just plug this, plug this back in 
and just reiterate over and over again. And that's how the diffusion Monte Carlo algorithm works. And if you recall from week two, when Paul introduced um, kind of variational and diffusion Monte Carlo, he talked about what the screens function looks like. Um, the screens function is responsible for the drift and diffusion of our electrons in the branching part of the greens function um, for reweighting of the walkers. So in the spin case where we've now extended our dimension or our particle coordinates from just spatial dimensions into an additional spin, the modification of the greens function looks like this, where we just have our normal greens function, but then we now incorporate additionally a drift and diffusion greens function that acts only on the spin variables. Um, and if you recall, if you just replace all these S's with R's, this is exactly the same Green's function that acts on our particle coordinates. Uh, so uh, that's really the only change in the diffusion Monte Carlo algorithm. And that brings us kind of finally to uh, the last part, and that is the relativistic pseudopotentials again. So in QMCPAC, we need to be able to use these kind of new pseudopotentials that act on both L and J states. Um, and so there were projectors over L, J, and M, J. But in QMCPAC, we actually make a slight change from this, uh, where it turns out that you can rewrite this kind of, this form of this relativistic pseudopotential into what we call an averaged relativistic or an AREP plus a spin orbit correction term, an SO rep. Uh, so the pseudo-potential, the average relativistic effective potential looks as follows, where it's, this is actually looks like the normal pseudo-potentials that we dealt with in week uh, six. They're just projectors over the spherical harmonics. Each angular momentum feels this potential uh, W sub L. But then the spin orbit correction um, actually generates the splitting in that you get a double sum over M and M prime and you get this new matrix element operator that now looks like you have L dot S. So this is this looks similar to what you've probably seen in like a perturbation theory where you've talked about spin orbit looking like an L dot S term. And so in Kim CPAC, all we need to do is incorporate in our pseudopotential XML files, just make sure that in the XML file, we have not only these A rep terms written out, but we also include these SO rep terms. And if they're included, you'll include spin orbit in your calculation. Um, one, I guess, thing to mention is that, uh, just for completeness sake, is that in the quantum chemistry community, uh, so atoms and molecules, we typically do talk about the fully relativistic pseudopotential in this way, where we decouple it into an A rep plus an SO rep. But in the DFT solid state world, where you're looking at like Trulli or Martin's type potentials or optimized potentials, uh, they actually work directly with these kind of WLJs, these uh, fully relativistic kind of potentials. They don't work in the decoupled A rep plus SO rep, but there's a straightforward relation between the two kind of shown down here. So you can, from one, you can get the other. Uh, I included this slide for completeness sake because, you know, it's always, a lot of times we show what this um, operator looks like, for example, for a pseudopotential but then it actually doesn't show all the nitty gritty details. And it, this looks a lot simpler than, it, <laughs> than the real expression. Uh, so whenever we actually apply the spin orbit onto a trial wave function, this is kind of what the uh, full evaluation looks like. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the detail, but if you stare at it very closely, you'll see that it's evaluated in a very, very similar way to how the normal non-local pseudopotentials are evaluated. The only difference is that you basically end up with a new L dot S matrix element and since we're using this kind of continuous spin representation, you can actually work out the spin um, expectation values in that representation. And it looks like this, but I'm not gonna go into all those details. So I've introduced all the pieces. Uh, we needed spinners. We needed to build the many body wave function out of the spinners, the single particle spinners. We needed to sample the spin degree of freedom and we needed to evaluate the pseudopotentials. So now I'm showing some examples where all this was actually done. Uh, so this is an example from uh, a paper where we looked at the uh, lead atom. We were using a large core pseudopotential. So we only had um, uh, four valence electrons on lead. Uh, and since the space was so small, we could actually do, given that pseudopotential and given those 
two component spinner formalisms in Dirac, we could also run the full configuration interaction within a given basis set. Full CI is, is an exact solution. So we actually are getting the exact eigenstates of this Hamiltonian within a given basis. What I'm showing with all these dots are the actual full configuration interaction calculations within kind of these different basis sets. And these are kind of the low-lying excited states of that Hamiltonian. The dashed lines are actually using diffusion Monte Carlo with spin orbit coupling using a very, very simple trial wave function. So we're not doing anything particularly special and just carrying out diffusion Monte Carlo, we actually get very, very close to the exact total energies to what we're seeing in the full configuration interaction. So that namely the exact solution, uh, very, very close in energies with a small fixed phase bias. And you'll see that, you know, we're reproducing the exact same splittings from the Hamiltonian and so this is a very, very um, nice demonstration of the, uh, of the method that we're able to get very, very accurate solutions for a given Hamiltonian and including spin orbit. If you had not included spin orbit, you would not be able to resolve all of these excited states <clears throat> of the lead atom. Um, we can also look at something more complicated than just you know, the atomic states of the lead atom. Uh, we looked at... Uh, the 10 dimer. So 10 is atomic number 50. And so nominally, you would think that spin orbit's not super important uh, for 10 and how it would impact the properties of the, of the 10 dimer. But if we carried out normal diffusion Monte Carlo on something as light as 10, we'd and not include spin orbit, just do a normal diffusion Monte Carlo calculation. Uh, you get this blue curve for the, for the binding curve. Uh, so the equilibrium bond length is, in, is pretty good. It agrees well with the experiment, but you'll notice that this dashed line here is the um, experimental uh, binding energy of the molecule. And you'll see that we overbind by a half an electron volt or more. And one may naively think that that is due to kind of a poor fixed node approximation and one would need to work with better trial wave functions. Um, but it really turns out that it's due to the neglect of spin orbit coupling on both the atom and the molecule. If you actually include spin orbit coupling on both the atom and the molecule, you get this red curve. So we carried out diffusion Monte Carlo with simple trial wave functions, including spin orbit coupling, and you end up getting almost perfect agreement with the experimental binding energy. Uh, and so this kind of demonstrates that spin orbit for something as light as 10 was actually making a pretty big impact. And it wasn't just errors in our trial wave functions. It was really the neglect of the spin orbit. And so spin orbit's important. Um, so that's kind of a summary of, or overview of spin orbit. Um, these relativistic effects like spin orbit are extremely important, uh, especially if you're trying to start studying heavier materials, heavier element containing materials. Um, up until now, QMC hasn't been able to deal with this because they, we didn't have all of this kind of incorporated into the, into the main codes, but now QMC pack has it. Um, we're able to perform, you know, normal JASTRO optimizations, wave function optimizations, variational Monte Carlo, diffusion Monte Carlo, all, with the, all in the presence of spin orbit. Um, it can be, as I mentioned, it's conveniently uh, incorporated into quantum Monte Carlo through the use of these relativistic effective core potentials, and we'd have to work with now two component spinners. Uh, and the only other kind of real caveat is that we now just carry around an extra additional you know, an additional degree of freedom, namely the spin variable. Uh, we also have interfaces to a, a few different codes, um, both for solid state and for uh, kind of quantum chemistry examples. So hopefully we'll start getting some users to start applying this. Um, so with that, I'll kind of leave it here uh, and take any questions. Uh, and then in the next section, we'll actually talk about how we can uh, do some simple atomic calculations uh, and include spin orbit and do your first kind of QMC calculation with spin orbit included. Thanks very much, Cody. Uh, so we do have one question uh, in the chat already and I encourage people to type uh, more. I have a couple in reserve just in case. First question is from uh, Roman Fanta. Uh, how do we deal with uh, spin orbit coupling and multi-reference systems. So is it possible and what do we have to be aware of? So um, it turns out that in a lot of cases, the systems do tend to be multi-reference. 
Um, and so in the QMC, all you need to be able to, I mean, the way to handle this is to work with multi-determinant wave functions that, you know, appropriately capture this, um, this multi-reference behavior. Um, and in fact, whenever we get into the tutorial later, where we're going to be looking at um, the atomic states of bismuth, we'll actually be dealing all with multi-reference systems or multi-reference states, and QMCPAC can handle the multi-slater determinant uh, wave functions that you need to do that. So we can do multi-determinant wave functions with spinners as the single particle orbitals. So I'm going to interject a question of my own. So Cody, you showed a very interesting result for tin just now, where with, yes, here on the right. So here there is a nearly half an electron volt shift in the, the binding energy. Uh, when spin orbit is included. And I was wondering um, if this has been studied more widely, or is it, or do you have a sense that there may be something special about the tin dimer that causes this to be particularly large? Um, we have examples where we've looked at, um, I think we published results on like tungsten oxide and the tungsten dimer as well. Um, and there are significant shifts between, I mean, tungsten's heavier, so spin orbit becomes even more important, but um, there are significant differences between the inclusion or the neglect of spin orbit coupling, depending on how heavy of a material you have. And so this, this does seem to be happening. As spin orbit becomes more important, you're going to start seeing it pop up. Um, and it will shift the binding energies around. And it's, it's because the total energies shift more in the atom than they do in the molecules. And so whenever you're calculating a relative energy difference, like a binding energy, um, you have to take that into account in order to get an accurate binding energy. So the, the, if the atom shifts more from spin orbit versus the molecule, that needs to be taken into account. Thanks. And while this slide is up, just a precision, this question from Edgar, and I think the answer is yes here, but just like to check, do the full CI calculations used to compare against the DMC with spin orbit coupling also include spin orbit coupling? Yes, so these are full CI with spinner wave functions. Uh, they have spin orbit in the Hamiltonian. It's, we're, we're using the exact, like, the exact same Hamiltonian. So it has the same non-local suit, the same average relativistic suit of potential, and then it also has the exact same spin orbit terms in the suit of potential. And so it's, a, it's literally a, an exact comparison between the, the exact solutions of this Hamiltonian versus the diffusion Monte Carlo on the exact solution or compared to the exact solution for that same Hamiltonian. Right, I, and I guess that's the figure from an exact figure exactly reproduced from that paper. So people could look there for more details. Yes. I have a question of my own, and this is relates to the cost of the calculations. Uh, I wonder if you just sort of comment generally. So now we have a, more complicated, maybe more expensive to really evaluate trial wave function. Uh, and then, of course, we still need to do the Monte Carlo and the spin moves and, and, and so on. So what are your impressions about the overall cost as compared to ground state fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo on the same system without spin orbit? Um, so the fact that you're working with complex wave functions already implies some additional cost. Um, but really, the main the sampling of the spin degree of freedom doesn't add too much. It's 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 just another number that you're sampling. But the real the real cost is actually in the evaluation of the pseudo potential ex itself, and it's because you've effectively doubled the number of non-local channels that you're having to evaluate. Um, so we're not only evaluating like if our pseudo potential has you know five channels here on L, we're going to have the same number on the spin orbit channel. Um, so you're basically doubling the number of non-local evaluations that you have to do for the pseudo potential, and that's where the real cost comes. But um, it's not prohibitive. Thanks. I think it's probably worth repeating that to evaluate the pseudo potential projectors, one has to evaluate the whole wave function or some ratio of it. So that's one of the yes. more expensive operations one can do in Quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, question from uh, Essan, how would this, uh, general question, how would this change for finite temperature? I guess the question is also depends how you're doing the finite temperature calculation, but does, does this generalize? Um, 
I'll just say that this is something I've not thought about. <laughs> um, but typically in, diff in diffusion Monte Carlo methods, we're working in a zero temperature, or you know, temperature is zero, so we're not doing finite temperature um, in kind of variational and diffusion Monte Carlo typically. So I'm not I'm not quite sure. Um, if you're doing finite temperature things, you would need to be working with a kind of a density matrix formalism, and I'm sure it could be generalized, but I haven't thought about it. And I don't know if you can see the questions. I'm not sure if you can interpret the question from Rashid. Uh, I'm not sure what RQM is in the question. So Rashid, you can feel free to read. Uh, relativistic oh, quantum mechanics. Okay. okay. Thank you. So yeah, this goes back to, um, well, hold on. Maybe I have a slide that is relevant. That's part of what mean. Well, so basically, I mean, this is kind of maybe the best way to, uh, it's hard to see, but if you, if you have the slides yourself, you can actually zoom in and just see one of these is a non, this is for the lead atom. So this is, you know, a relatively heavy, um, Z is 82. Um, these are looking at the single particle states for non-relativistic Hamiltonian versus actually looking at what happens whenever you turn on relativity. And just focusing even right here on the 1S level, these are the single particle states. I mean, you can see a huge shift in the total energy. I mean, these are, you know, log scales. So you can see that the, the single particle energy of the 1S state shifts, the single particle energy, the 6S shifts. And if you're really trying to get the physics right, you'll notice that the 6P states get split. And so the relativity kind of not only shifts around the single particle energies, but it also generates these splittings of the states. And this becomes more and more drastic as you move into heavier and heavier materials. And so you really need to deal with some sort of relativistic treatment. Um, and the way that we go about it is to work with pseudopotentials that um, remove the core electrons, but then also are generalized to act on these J states so that they can actually generate these splittings. But the heavier the, heavier the elements you get, the more drastic the shifts are from kind of a non-relativistic picture. So the levels all shift and certain states get split into J states. Hopefully that answers your question. I think it does. Uh, maybe one last, I'm gonna introduce one last, says yes, thanks. Uh, one last question of my own, perhaps before we then have a, a short break. Is it necessary to include uh, additional uh, electrons in the valence of the shooter potentials uh, with when spin orbit is included, or is it really the the J terms and sort of the standard formalism seems to be sufficient? Standard choices seem to be sufficient. You don't need to necessarily include more electrons in the pseudo potential um, because of the spin orbit. Um, this is more of a, of a, this is similar to what you have to do in normal pseudopotentials uh, without spin orbit in that if you're, the valence that you've chosen for your pseudopotential ends up giving you poor agreement with experiment or poor agreement with the underlying all electron theory that generated the pseudopotential, uh, you might be getting into a regime where the pseudopotential is no longer accurate. And you really need to start including semi-core states in order to kind of increase the accuracy. Um, for example, in um, I believe in week six, whenever we talked about pseudopotentials, there was the uh, the correlation consistent ECPs, the CCECPs, where they were showing plots of binding energies of molecules and how you started to compress them. Um, if you were to choose different valence spaces, like smaller valence spaces, you end up getting larger and larger errors as you begin to, like say, compress the pseudopotential or compress the molecule, um, but you can improve that significantly if you kind of increase the valence space. And the same is true in the relativistic sense. Um, and it, most of the error actually comes from how accurate is your averaged part of the pseudopotential, the average relativistic. The spin orbit is um, kind of a smaller correction on top of that. But really, um, if your average relativistic pseudopotential isn't accurate, then um, you need to probably move to a, a larger valence space. So for the hands-on, um, I thought it'd be worthwhile to go through kind of a, 
relatively simple example, um, but it kind of highlights some of the things that you have to think about um, when doing spin orbit on uh, atoms and molecules. Uh, so we're going to look at the bismuth atom, and we're going to use the Dirac interface that I mentioned kind of earlier, and then also at the end carry out some QMC calculations on some of the spin orbit split states. Um, so just a reminder, uh, all of the info is um, on this GitHub page in week eight. Um, I put up a README file that has um, a bunch of figures and equa or some equations and kind of de somewhat detailed walkthroughs of both the input files and the output files for um, Dirac. And the reason that I had to do this is because right now there's no interface to um, Dirac from Nexus, which is what you've been using the whole time. So we unfortunately have to do things the old fashioned way. Um, but so hopefully the uh, walkthrough on the um, GitHub page is uh, detailed enough to help you get through the inputs and then also modify them for whatever um, system you may be interested in. Um, also, I guess this should be mentioned in case you've not done it in the workshop image, it's, you should, uh, if you want to do these examples, you need to do a git pull and actually rebuild QMC pack, um, recompile QMC pack. Um, the convert for QMC converter, which we'll be using in the tutorial, um, had a update to it um, that is important for this to make it a much simpler for the user um, that was pushed after the final workshop image was made. So um, just be aware that you need to kind of re recompile QMC pack and just do a git pull and you should be good. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at is the bismuth atom. Um, and in particular, if you look at bismuth, um, it has a 6P3 kind of configuration. Um, if you want to look at the experimental kind of atomic spectra, you can, I added a link down here at the NIST atomic spectra database, and it has all of the atomic states of bismuth uh, that you may be interested in. You'll notice that the first three um, states are all of this, all 6P3 states, and they correspond to these various term symbols. So if you recall, a term symbol is 2S plus 1, L is the angle, total angular momentum, and then you have a J to quantum number. Um, in the experimental spectrum, they measure and um, label the states as following. So you have a 4S 3 half state, a 2D 3 half state, um, a 2D 5 half state, a 2P 1 half state, and a 2P 3 half state. Um, of course, you can't turn on and off spin orbit in nature, but if you recall, spin orbit is essentially splitting of certain levels, and it basically amounts to a J averaged kind of energy. And so the averaged relativistic sense would be actually a J averaged kind of description. So instead of having these five kind of different term symbols that have each with these experimental gaps, 1.4, 1.9, 2.6, 4.1, .1, you end up with kind of only three distinct levels that are um, just a 4S, a 2D state, and a 2P state. And that's because the 2D 5 halves and the 2D 3 halves get J-weighted and averaged uh, between this 1.9 and 1.46 EV gap and to give you a 1.71 EV gap. And then the same goes for the 2P 1 half and the 2D 3 halves. They get J-averaged to give you kind of what you would see if spin orbit wasn't a thing uh, in some sense. So this is what, um, if you were to do a, a scalar relativistic calculation with a pseudo-potential that doesn't include spin orbit in QMC or whatever method you prefer, you should be, if you're agreeing with experiment, you should be seeing these kind of energy gaps between these states. Whereas if you have spin orbit, you should be able to resolve all of these states. And this is what we're gonna try and do today. Okay, so focusing in first on the non-spin orbit case, the J averaged, um, we're going to be using Dirac, which is, as I mentioned, a relativistic quantum chemistry code. Um, and first thing we're going to do is do an average of configurations SCF. This is just how Dirac does it. Um, so SCF is self-consistent field. So you're doing a, a self-consistent field calculation on the open shell kind of states. And then if you don't have spin orbit, what you're av actually averaging the states over are the P states. So you have to specify in the code an active like an open shell active space. So in this case, 
we're interested in p electrons and we have three of them since it's a 6p3 and we're going to distribute those electrons amongst kind of the px states the py states and the pz states and they can be either up or down so there's six total possibilities that um and how you can distribute these that implies that you have six choose three which is equal to 20. so you have 20 total kind of determinants that you could possibly build out of all of the kind of occupations of single particle orbitals. The average of, config of configurations, what it does is a self-consistent procedure to update these orbitals such that you minimize the uh, averaged energy over all 20 of those determinants. And then if you actually wanna resolve and get the open shell states, um, get the actual eigenstates for the Hamiltonian, you can then go through and follow up with what's called an open uh, complete open shell CI or yeah, complete open shell CI. And that um, basically diagonalizes it in the basis of those 20 determinants to give you 20 new single particle states. And those 20 possible states, assuming everything works correctly, should correspond to the 4S term symbol, the 2D term symbol and the 2P term symbol. And they should all be have the appropriate degeneracies. So the 4s should have um, be fourfold degenerate. So we should end up with 20 eigenstates that are, or sorry, four eigenstates that are fourfold degenerate. You should end up with 10 for the 2d, 10 states that are um, degenerate for the 2d. And then for the 2p, you should end up with uh, six total states. So six plus 10 plus four is 20. So we have 20 total states. Um, that's what we're looking for. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through this in great detail on the GitHub page, which I've you know provided the link here again. Um, in example one, I go through and talk about everything you need in the input files to actually obtain and do this um, complete open shell configuration interaction on all of these you know neglecting spin orbit uh, J average states. So in Dirac, you need two inputs. You need a mole file, which is um, basically specifies all the all of the molecular information that you need. So it has a section that you specify the geometry. In this case, we just have a single atom at the origin, so it's not too complicated. Um, for each atom, you have to specify a basis set. Um, here, I just did a uncontracted basis. Uh, it's also relatively straightforward. I go into more detail on the GitHub page. And then lastly, there's uh, the pseudo potential. So this is kind of the bread and butter of what we're doing in the code. Um, you specify the pseudo potential parameters, um, which you can get from various, um, you can find them from various sources. In this case, I'm using a Stuttgart pseudo potential. Um, you can find them on their webpage. Um, and in order to do the spin averaged or the J averaged solution where we're not including spin orbit, if you recall, I said in the quantum chemistry community, we actually specify the pseudo potentials as the averaged relativistic potential plus the spin orbit term. So in Dirac, that's exactly how it works. And if you want to neglect spin orbit, you just don't include those terms. So um, I talk about it on the GitHub page, but there's an extra parameter telling you how many spin orbit terms you have. And in this case, I put zero. So we don't have any spin orbit. We just are doing the average relativistic solution, which should hopefully, which I'll show in a second, correspond to these states. Uh, then you also need an input file um, and in the input file you just specify what you're trying to do um, we have a Hamilton ECP Hamiltonian we're trying to calculate a wave function we're going to analyze the wave function uh, and when we calculate the wave function we have to tell it what's what we're doing so as I mentioned on the previous slide um, we're trying to distribute three p electrons amongst the six p states um, there's kind of a way to do that in the input, tell it I want three electrons as an open shell amongst the six p states. Uh, so I specify the full atomic configuration that I'm interested in, and then I tell it I want to resolve it into the complete open shell CI. So I get all of the twenty possible eigenstates. And then lastly, for QMC pack purposes, we need to actually print all of the orbitals so that whenever I run the converter, I can, you know, we can actually read the spinners from the output. Um, so you, this section is actually required. And I talk a little bit more about that in, on the GitHub page as well. Uh, then to run Dirac uh, in, the, um, in the image, all you have to do is 
call this um, pam dash dirac script, which is just a Python script that should be in your path um, that uh, basically calls Dirac and does everything for you. This is provided by Dirac. Um, and then you just provide it the input file with the dash dash input equals the input file and then a dash dash mole for the dot mole file. And once you've done that, Dirac should run and you should have uh, your wave functions and everything calculated. So in the first example, like I said, we're doing spin average states of bismuth. Uh, so if you actually follow that link I gave at the beginning for the NIST atomic spectra database, you should, it should take you to a page that looks something like this, where it gives you all the term symbols, where I'm, which is actually how I generated this figure, was looking at kind of the experimental details. We have a 4s 3 half state, which gives us the term, the term symbol, the 2d 3 halves and a 2d 5 halves, and then a 2p 1 half and a 2p 3 halves. And then it gives us the energy levels, like how what the energy differences between the states are. But you can also tell it to give us the J averaged or the term energy. Uh, so this is exactly how I'm calculating what we're seeing if we neglect spin orbit. Um, so it does a J weighted average between the 2D three halves, 2D five halves to give us this uh, term energy for the 2D state, which should be 1.7. And then the term energy for the 2P state, which should be 3.6. And this is what we should hopefully see or see something close if we calculate this uh, with the pseudo-potentials and the complete open shell CI method. Once you run Dirac, somewhere towards the bottom of the, of the output file, you should see exactly what it did. So first it averaged and minimized the, uh, optimized the orbitals to minimize this average of configuration energy. So that was averaging over the 20 determinants. Um, and then it resolved to give us the states. And you'll see now that there's only three energy levels, which is consistent with the experimental picture we should see for this 6P3 configuration. Uh, and the degeneracies look right. So the lowest lying state is fourfold degenerate, which should correspond to this 4S state, 4S term. Uh, the second state is tenfold degenerate, or the second energy is tenfold degenerate. Uh, and that should correspond to this 2D state. 2D term. And then lastly, uh, you have a six-fold degeneracy, which should um, correspond to that 2P. And if, um, if you kind of then look at those energy differences and calculate them in electron volts, you'll see, now we can compare to the experimental numbers, uh, you'll see that the energy difference for the 2D term for this, um, using the complete open shell configuration interaction method comes out to be 1.5 EV. So that has an error of 0.163, which is not too bad. But then for the 2p state, you see a huge error. So it, it only comes out to 2.585 electron volts, whereas experimentally, it should be about 3.6. So there's a huge error, um, which is actually due to the quality of the average relative, the A rep part of the pseudo potential. Um, but now we'll see what happens if we turn on the spin orbit. So as I mentioned, the only change to turn on spin orbit is to actually, in the mole file, you need to actually specify how many spin orbit terms you want to include and then just provide the parameters for the pseudo potential. And I've provided that on the, on the GitHub page as well. Um, so now we're going to do the exact same procedure in the second example, where we're going to do the average of configurations SCF. But now the states that we're distributing over, instead of it being the you know, PX1, the PX, PY, PZ, either up or down, now they're kind of J quantum states. So we have a P3 halves and a P1 half, each with the different M quantum numbers. So plus or minus one half, plus or minus three halves, or plus or minus one half for the P1 half state. But again, that totals out to six total P states that we're going to distribute three electrons in. So that implies six choose three. So you have 20 total determinants again. We just carry out the exact same procedure. We do the average of configurations, average of the energy over those 20 determinants. Now they're built out of spinners, the, the determinants. And then you can do the complete open shell CI again and resolve it to give you the, the, um, the eigenstates again. So these are now gonna be the complete open shell um, configuration interaction states. And they're going to correspond to, assuming everything goes correctly, it should correspond to the, the actual experimental spectrum. So it should correspond to the 4s3 halves, the 2d3 halves, the 2d5 halves, the 2p1 half, and the 2p3 halves, which I've illustrated up here. 
and they should have the appropriate degeneracies. So you should see that the 4S is again a fourfold degenerate. The 2D three halves should be fourfold and the 2D five halves should be six. So six plus four is 10. That was the degeneracy of the 2D, but now it's split. And so hopefully we see that we'll get four and six total states. And then for the um, same goes for the P, this should be twofold degenerate and this should be fourfold degenerate. And recall the degeneracy is just um, 2J plus one. So if J is three halves, then it should be four. Okay, so now looking back at the kind of NIST atomic spectra database, um, now we're actually focusing on the real kind of experimental levels, the, the real term symbols that we're you know, trying to calculate because we're now including spin orbit. All we did was add those spin orbit terms to the pseudopotential. And we should hopefully get five different distinct energies for the five different levels and they should hopefully have decent gaps. So if you run Dirac, you should see something like this. It provides you with the averaged energy again, and you can verify that averaging over these appropriately gives you that energy. But now you diagonalize and you get these kind of five distinct energies, and these correspond directly to these levels. And now you'll notice they actually do have the appropriate degeneracies. So the, fourfold, the first fourfold degenerate corresponds to the 4s3 halves, then you have a four and a six, which both correspond to the 2D three halves and 2D five halves state. And then the same goes for the, uh, the last two, the 2P one half and the 2P three halves, which are twofold and fourfold degenerate, as I mentioned. So now we can actually calculate these energy differences compared to the ground state and compare now to experiment again. And you'll see that by turning on spin orbit, you actually do improve things quite a bit at the complete open shell CI level. Uh, so for the 2D three halves, you have an, an energy error of about 0.12 EV. Uh, for the 2D five halves, it's about 2.21. For the 2P one half, it's about 0.4. So that's the largest error so far uh, with spin orbit. And then you have the 2P three halves, which is about 0.3 EV. So this is how you generate the you calculate the COSCI um, states in Dirac. And now what we want to do is actually do a spin orbit calculation in Quantum Monte Carlo. So what we want to do is be able to take these eigenstates, these trial wave functions, or make trial wave functions out of these kind of multi-reference states, uh, which looks something like this. And we're going to tack on a JASTER factor, uh, just put in, you know, tack on some JASTER factor out front optimize the JASTER parameters and carry out diffusion Monte Carlo and see if we actually improve the agreement with experiment compared against, you know, the largest error here is about 0.4 EV, the other state's about 0.3. So we'll see if we can do better with QMC. So in the second example, this is what we actually go through and I, I talk through this on that readme file. Um, so what we're gonna do to generate the, generate both the, the multi-reference wave functions, which is going to read from the Dirac output and generate the appropriate kind of JASTER parameters and everything that we need, we're going to run um, convert for QMC. Um, so we're going to run the, the convert for QMC, and this is going to give us all of the information that we need. But first, what we're going to do is test that the converter works. Uh, this is always a good test to do to make sure that you actually have the state and the wave function that you're interested in. And so the way that we're gonna do this is to run convert for QMC and tell it we're not gonna take a JASTER factor. Uh, so convert for QMC just takes, we tell it Dirac, we're gonna point it to the Dirac output file. Um, we're gonna say no JASTER, and then we're gonna tell it which state we want. Um, and if you'll notice, um, if you run the converter, you'll see that it actually goes through and analyzes all of the states that Dirac gave you and tells you how many determinants are in that expansion um, with each symmetry that it has. Uh, and you'll notice that um, there's 20 total states as expected. Um, some of these are, um, you know, five determinants. Some of them are one determinant. It just kind of depends. Um, and if you look at the output in the Dirac, it actually lists all of the um, CI expansions. And so this is what the code actually will, the converter will go in and grab all this for you and generate this 
multi-reference wave function internally for PMC pack. And so the user doesn't have to go in and specify any of this. You just tell it uh, the first state is zero. So I'm going to tell it target state in the converter as zero, and it's going to give us exactly the CI expansion. And so if I want, you know, if I wanted this state down here, I would tell it state 16. And that would end up being a two determinant wave function. So it just kind of depends. If we run with no JASTRO, that actually just measures the variational energy of the wave function. And so that should, assuming that there's no bugs in the converter and assuming there's no bugs in QMC pack, uh, you should be able to reproduce exactly the total energy that you see in Dirac. And so in the example, I worked through this first just to make sure that we're able to reproduce these CI expansions. Uh, and I show that down here. Um, if you go through and you run um, the converter on no Dirac on, or no JASTRO, run the converter for the first five states, it should correspond to these five energies, uh, one of the states. And if you run VMC, you should be able to reproduce those energies. So you'll see that uh, for the first state, I ran it a little bit longer and I have lower error bars. And so you can see that I directly agree to within kind of the statistical uncertainty, uh, the actual state, the energy. And this is a five determinant wave function. So this is actually multi-reference with spin orbit with no JASTRO and it should reproduce the C of SCI energy. And then I did the same for all of the next, you know, the next energy levels. Um, I just didn't run it as long. And so you can see that within statistical errors, we still agree again. Okay, so now that you're convinced that the trial wave functions are reasonable, now what we can do is go through and go into the next step of the workflow and to actually optimize the JASTROs. Um, so we're going to tack on now a JASTRO factor to each of those multi-slater determinant expansions, optimize the JASTROs, and then run variational and diffusion Monte Carlo on them with spin orbit, and we'll see what we get. Um, okay, so now to actually do that with the converter, all you need to do is drop that no JASTRO flag, and it will then generate a new output file, or sorry, will generate new in QMC pack input files sorry, that um, have all of the appropriate blocks that we need to kind of carry out the full VMC DMC workflow. So we'll first start with a kind of initial VMC to get things going, and then it'll carry out some number of optimization loops. I just uh, grab these directly from the output file or the files that were generated from the converter. Uh, so it generates some default number of parameters from the optimizer. Um, it will then generate you after all of the optimization is done, it will generate you a VMC block and then a DMC block. And then once you have that DMC block, uh, if you just run this input, it will go through and it will optimize and then carry out VMC and DMC. And so by doing that, you'll have done your first um, spin orbit QMC calculations. Uh, if you run, so for simplicity, just to kind of demonstrate this, I'm only gonna run the example on one of the one of the degenerate states for the 4s3 halves, and then one of the degenerate states for the 2p3 halves state. Uh, and so I actually went through and did this, uh, ran the JASTRO optimization, um, ran the VMC and DMC, and I'm plotting. Um, if you run QMCA, the analysis tool, it'll print you out all the information, just to show you that spin orbits actually included um, in the non-local or the local and non-local ECP, that actually corresponds directly to this average relativistic potential that I was talking about earlier. And then the spin orbit is actually just labeled as this SOECP. So that's the spin orbit, and you can see what the contribution to the energy is for each of these calculations, so for each of these states. Um, and then if you actually carry out the energy differences or calculate the energy differences, you'll see that, okay, so the ground state energy was corresponded to this 4S 3 half state. I ended up getting, uh, negative 5.3885 after JASTRO optimization and VMC and DMC. Then for the 2P3 half state, I got 2.417. Uh, and if I calculate the energy difference between that, that gives me about four electron volts. So 3.99 plus or minus 0.05 electron volts. Um, if I look at the experimental gap, it's 4.1 EV. So basically I've, I've got a 0.1 electron volt error Whereas at the complete open shell CI level, it was 4.4. So the energy, the error at the complete open shell CI level was 0.3 electron volts, whereas diffusion Monte Carlo improved it 
down to about 0.1. Right. So um, that is the tutorial. So you should be able to go through and reproduce those steps and reproduce kind of this energy difference, you know, roughly to within the statistical error by optimizing. Uh, but you can also go through and calculate the energy differences for all the various states. And you should be able to see that DMC improves upon the complete open shell CI for all of these energy differences. You should be able to improve upon this, um, the 2D3 halves energy gap, the 2D5 halves, and the 2P1 half. Um, and then uh, the calculations that I did, uh, I'll just say, weren't um, using full production level um, parameters. I just did it kind of quickly just to kind of demonstrate. So you can actually fiddle with kind of improving your convergence or improving your optimization steps, um, increasing the number of blocks in your DMC, um, et cetera, just kind of improving your simulation. But you should be able to see that the Diffusion Monte Carlo improves things. Uh, and that's basically the first um, kind of QMC calculations that you can do with spin orbit. Um, I I believe that I gave enough information on that GitHub tutorial to kind of demonstrate how you would modify the inputs to look at something else, like a different atom, or look at different molecules for um, indirect to generate those kinds of trial wave functions. And then you can use the exact same convert for QMC workflow, and it should just um, it should just uh, you know, it should just carry out. You don't have to do anything special. It just generates the wave the input files for you. Um, and with that, I think I'm done. I don't think I have anything else. Um, oh, one thing is that um, I mentioned in the previous section that we did and we do have the ability to do solid state spin orbit calculations, and this tutorial doesn't cover that. Um, so if you're interested in starting to do anything like that, please reach out to me or some of the other developers, and we can uh, discuss how to kind of start handling doing that in the solid state. Uh, but with that, I think I'll end and take any other questions. Thanks very much, Cody. Uh, so we'll give people a moment to uh, ask uh, any questions. I see Ray had a question about wanting to look at the optimization blocks in the VNC. So uh, I don't know what he wanted me to say about them other than show them. So looking at those, I, I don't see anything particularly uh, special uh, about them. Is there anything you would like to, to highlight? I think because the point is they're made for the, you know, they're, they're produced by the, the converter and you can run them. Yeah, so they're, they're, con they're just generated by the converter. The only thing that you would need to do is, um, you know, you can increase the number of optimization steps. You can increase the number of samples. I kind of modified them just for some quick, like dirty tests on the, um, you know, to, on small, you know, if you have a small computer, like you can just go in and modify them to make it run fast enough so that you can test it. Um, but really you would just need to modify certain parameters like the number of samples. Um, if you're doing a production calculation, you may want to increase the number of walkers and the number of blocks to get good statistics. But the main thing, is that you'll notice that there's nothing here about spin orbit anywhere in any of these blocks. And so really there's, there's only one parameter in the inputs, in the XML input that needs to, that is needed to be able to do a spin orbit calculation. And those are kind of buried in the particle set. Um, and you just tell it that I have spinners. You just say spinner equals yes. And it knows now that these are all spinner calculations and then if you actually want to include spin orbit, your pseudo potential file needs to have it. But in terms of everything else, there's nothing special. Like your your optimization doesn't have anything, any special parameters. Your VMC and your DMC doesn't have any special parameters that you need to modify. Thanks very much, Cody. So I see there's sort of like a sort of a technical question that we'll have to to follow up running one of the examples. Yes. But I don't see any more uh, general questions. So I think we can leave it here. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Cody. So as we've 
we've now reached the uh, end of the workshop. I just have a few slides to share. And actually, Cody, if you can confirm that I'm I'm successful in doing this. Uh, yes, I see your slides. Great. Well, we've reached the uh, end of the workshop, and before uh, wrapping up, I wanted to, to point to some sort of next uh, steps and give everyone a chance uh, to ask questions live before we close uh, the session. So I just have a very small handful of slides here. The first one sort of piece of housekeeping, uh, we would really appreciate if everyone could complete the workshop survey. Uh, we're inevitably going to be making another one of these workshops or some sort of user meeting in the future, and we would like to make it as effective as possible. Uh, of course, it's much harder to see uh, how well these are going, running these, these virtually, so we'd really appreciate uh, your input. Uh, everyone should have received this uh, by email, so please don't hold back in any suggestions on how we could have improved what we covered in this workshop some uh, suggestions for what we could cover next time, and also what format uh, the next time should take. Uh, perhaps we'll have a hybrid meeting, for example, if you have some suggestions on how to do that, uh, that would be appreciated. And then of course, more generally, if you have some thoughts on how perhaps we as a community could improve a QMC, or perhaps more specifically on how we can improve you know, the codes and tools uh, that you've seen throughout this workshop to make them more useful for research, uh, we're all uh, is, and uh, we'll, we'll try and implement uh, any good uh, suggestions that we see. So uh, please send in the, the survey. So just a few points on some, some next steps. Uh, when we sent out the uh, mid-workshop survey, uh, a few people said, you know, they hadn't had a, a chance to to, to run the virtual machine and run the, the images of that, uh, run the examples at that point. And really that's the best way to get up to speed with this methodology. So if you haven't uh, tried some of the examples already, uh, give that a go. And then one next step you could certainly do very easily in the, in the same resources would be to try running a different molecule, for example. So a few weeks ago, we ran a water It'd be very easy to run a small hydrocarbon such as methane or ethene and then look at the charge density, for example, or some of the other observables. Of course, moving on to, to larger calculations, it's be useful to install the software on your own uh, you know, clusters or local machines and the uh, workshop install script, of course, can be used as uh, inspiration for that. And of course, there are lots of examples in the QMC pack manual on how to, to do that with various operating systems and so on. Also, over the last few weeks, we had lots of citations to, to recent papers, particularly last week with the research presentation. So I have a suggestion to, to look at some of the recent literature. And then, of course, ultimately, the way one gets up to speed with uh, a new method is to, to try and set up a research problem and you know, use it to get uh, new data where the method is, is really warranted and the answer uh, is needed. So what to do then if along the way you have some uh, questions? So here are some notes about sort of ongoing uh, support. And I'm also answering some, some of the questions that came up in the mid-workshop survey uh, at this point. So first of all, this, this workshop Slack that we set up, we're going to keep uh, this uh, open. So you can, of course, post uh, questions there. And we will be uh, updating the workshop virtual machine image, making a new version of that with you know, the final version of all the files. We're very conscious that we've been asking you all to sort of patiently update the files from week to week, and we'll make a new version uh, with every, all the final versions of the software included. Uh, we also had a few questions about running on Apple's new hardware. And when we get our hands on 
some examples will provide a sort of tested set of instructions on how to run uh, on those uh, machines. Uh, you'll see from the survey that we're also interested in providing you know, sort of all this software uh, in an image sort of on an ongoing basis so that people can, can run QMC easily. If you have any suggestions there, that would also be uh, appreciated. So how can one obtain sort of support more and more generally? Uh, well, there's sort of two main routes here. Uh, one is to use the QMC pack Google group shown here at the sort of bottom left. This is sort of, like, sort of general uh, research questions, maybe not too, too technical. And then uh, that's quite a low traffic, uh, perhaps you know, a few postings per month. So it shouldn't be very burdensome. I could appreciate if people would subscribe to that. And of course, another way is through the QMC pack GitHub. So this is at github.com slash QMC pack slash QMC pack. And we, of course, triage uh, any bug reports or feature requests uh, about the code uh, there and also all the tools that one needs to do the QMC calculations. And of course, I know that some people don't have access to the QMC pack uh, Google group from their institution. So you can, of course, use the uh, GitHub there as well. So general science questions could also be put there. Uh, generally, uh, you know, any updates to this, we'll put on the QMC pack uh, homepage, qmcpack.org. This is, for example, one of the places where we advertise uh, this workshop. And uh, you're, of course, welcome to contact us directly. Uh, if you have any suggestions for big updates here, for example, feel free to shoot me uh, an email. And I'm sure all the, the workshop presenters would appreciate uh, an email as well if you have a you know, pertinent question. So that's how you can obtain sort of ongoing uh, support. And just before we close this, I wanted to give a final chance to see if people had any uh, ongoing, uh, ongoing questions. Of course, the, as I said, the Slack channel will remain open, but we're gonna be wrapping up uh, in a few minutes. So I just pause to see if there are any questions. All right, well, I don't see any questions. Thanks for the thanks. Uh, and actually uh, on that note, uh, just to wrap up, I'd like to um, thank everyone for their participation. Very much enjoyed this uh, virtual format. Uh, I hope to meet some of you, uh, all the organizers hope to meet uh, some, of, some of you uh, in the real world at a science conference. Otherwise, we hope to meet you at the next uh, QMC PAC workshop presumably next year. Thanks very much. And thank you, Paul, for organizing and hosting and everything. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>